Hi everyone, welcome back. You will notice the lack of a millennial pause after the uh, the this screen goes live because um, I'm not a millennial, and uh, you'll also notice that I'm not a Gen Z. But uh, in any case, um, welcome, welcome on on the show. I'm a little late today. I am completely messed up from uh, after a huge series of travels, uh, the bulk of which were spent in in uh, uh, in uh, Korea and. Uh, it was amazing, and I want to tell you all about it. There's a lot of things happening on Avalanche. It's a really glorious week, and there will be many more of these to come, I hope. And, uh, and I'm really, really excited to, to share with you a little bit about the, the things that, uh, that I did recently. So let's, let's get started. Um, let me see. I'm in the wrong tab here. So here we go. The big news from, uh, from, uh, from last week was uh, SK Planet. Now, you probably don't know what SK Planet is. Um, depending on where you live, you may or may not have heard of SK, but SK stands for South Korea, and uh, it is one of the biggest companies in South Korea. It's a giant holding company. SK Planet is uh, one of the two biggest uh, companies underneath that umbrella, and uh, we just signed a big memorandum of understanding to build a lot of stuff for, with, together on uh, Avalanche. So this is really big. SK Planet has a huge number of users, and uh, oh, this is a here we go. So there's a huge uh, uh, number of users. They will be building a subnet. It makes absolute sense for them. They wanted to have their own chain. They want to be able to have control over certain aspects of it, and at the same time, they want to have transparency, openness, all of those good things that come with blockchains. In particular, they want to be operating an open platform. They want to create uh, opportunities for third parties to come in. And the best way I know, and the best way that any technologist will tell you, uh, to create a platform where unrelated third parties can come together and uh, build together on an equal footing without anybody monopolizing the underlying platform and gaining an unfair advantage is to build a blockchain. And what better platform to do that, that with than the Avalanche one, which was designed from the get-go with this particular use case in mind. On day one, I told you about subnets. Nobody listened then because everyone was, was busy listening to uh, whatever it is that, uh, that, you know, that all of those made up terms that uh, a certain group that puts out constantly. But, uh, but it's big now and it's going to get even bigger. So uh, they're going to have uh, about 60,000 merchants. When we talk about an open platform, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So uh, these 60,000 people need to be on an equal footing. They need to, to have assurance that everything's operating openly. And, um, and uh, the number of actual users that this thing can bring in is on the order of about 38 million. So let that sink in. These are really, really large deals. In the West, I think people are going to discount these because when people don't understand and when the numbers are large, they just kind of, it just goes out of their mind, right? So this is like, this is why people, they don't know what to do about uh, nuclear power plants, but then they, they, they discuss bike sheds to, to, uh, uh, to, at, at great length. So it's one of those kinds of situations. This is a lot of users coming on chain and it's going to be amazing for us because there's going to be all sorts of spillover effects, especially because of the the nature of the initial assets that are being planned for digitization here. So uh, once again, the thesis behind Avalanche was to tokenize all of the world's assets and to do it in a way that's compliant with whatever the, the, the prevailing laws of, 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 uh, of those assets might be. And uh, here we have a picture perfect example of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of one of those cases. So I'm thrilled and uh, I was uh, thrilled to hold a, a um, um, a, a hackathon there, so you'll see me standing. I think I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm I'm right here. I'm under the Y over here, uh, surrounded by an amazing set of people who showed up. If you showed up and I did not manage to talk to you, I, I sincerely apologize. Please get in touch with me. I tried my best, and uh, it was a fantastic time for for all. I think you know, I really enjoyed it. It is a bear market, people say, and. Uh, and yet, this is the kind of turnout that you know that you would expect on a not bear market. So there is a lot of interest in the area. That was amazing to see. Korea is in a very different regulatory regime than us, and they're enjoying the fruits of that clarity. So they're still waiting for some additional regulation around security tokens, 
And when they do get that sorted out, they're going to be even further ahead uh, than the US. But, um, but they're in a very different space than us. And that clarity is, is going to pay dividends for them. And, uh, and I think we, we did a great job of uh, partnering with one of the biggest companies in Korea. At the same time, this is a company that people take uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, I don't know what the word is, a bellwether, if you will, a, a director, a mentor, um, a, um, the, uh, the kind of company that other people emulate. So uh, if you're in a, you know, uh, if you're in a different company and uh, you want to make sure that you make technologically sound choices, you typically don't want to buck the trend and go away from what SK is doing. And here we are. So I'm thrilled about this uh, this partnership. I'm, I was also thrilled to be in Korea um, during, uh, during uh, we just got so lucky and it was the bloom season. So then there is an open discussion now. Is Tokyo during uh, the spring bloom better or is Seoul during the spring bloom better? I don't know. I, I have been lucky enough to be in both cities at just the right times. I was in Tokyo four years ago, I think, and I uh, was in Seoul just uh, two weeks ago. Um, you might also want to compare DC. I think it's peak uh, spring bloom in DC this weekend, which is also beautiful. And um, I don't know why there has to be a winner. They can all be winners too. But it was amazing. Just uh, the vibe in the air was fantastic. The weather was fantastic. It was springtime. It was beautiful out. We were surrounded by fantastic people. And uh, we also were surrounded by not only uh, the crypto, hardcore crypto crowd that you would expect to see in a bear market, but also a lot of corporate people who want the benefits of blockchains and uh, they want to move forward and uh, they're eager to do so and, and they're looking for platforms. So uh, SK is the one that's been made public. I spoke to a great number of companies. It was just overall a fantastic trip, not to mention the food, uh, not to mention the new people I met. So uh, it was just absolutely amazing. I had such a great time. We as a team had a great time. So it's been a, an incredibly productive trip. You can see uh, some of my people there looking goofy on the side over here. Again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but uh, but they're, they've been amazing. And uh, we've generally had so much fun um, talking to, uh, to to the people who make decisions on, on blockchains. And uh, and so, uh, so there's that, um, you know, and, and we even had a chance to, we, we didn't get to see the pictures there, I guess. Uh, we even got a chance to see the palace. It was great. Saw the palace from a very interesting angle too, from up above. Um, so that was fun. And uh, just generally, uh, it's so nice to be in a country which has regulatory clarity, a good community, a strong community, and, uh, and a set of, uh, set of use cases that are compelling for blockchain, where the, where the tokens are not an afterthought, where the tokens are deeply integrated into what's happening. Okay, on to the next big topic, Avasans. So this is a new program. This was announced when I was in Korea. And uh, let's take a look at this visual. I think this is David. I don't know if you have seen the statue, and, uh, but when you see it, it's just amazing. Um, it's really touching. There are a couple of times in my life where in the presence of art, I thought I was a changed person. This definitely was one of them. Just the, the hand, the luminescence, uh, the features. This is this thing is just an amazing thing. And, um, and, uh, and indeed, uh, Avasans is all about this kind of art on chain. So there are two pillars to this. <clears throat> one of them is the artist in residence program. The other one is the Mona Lisa Initiative. The uh, artist in residence program is uh, what you expect it to be. It's, uh, it's essentially a selection of 50 artists or so who will be selected to participate in a six month program where they work with uh, support from Ava Labs and professional mentors. So some, many of these mentors are outside of Ava Labs. They're just uh, people who understand the NFT scene. Uh, the applications are open until the end of April. So if you are one of these people who are who, who might be interested, or if you know someone who might be interested in becoming an NFT artist, uh, so uh, please get them to apply. Uh, the acceptable applicants, the, the accepted applicants will receive funding, mentorship, and more. Um, so uh, uh, there are uh, three uh, uh, mentors um, that have been announced. Emini LaRussa, she's a uh, she's an Emmy-winning motion graphics artist. Dave Krugman is a photographer and All Ships founder. And Ryan Wen, 
founder of the Valhalla NFT project. And uh, that was actually cool NFTs, by the way. So, um, so fantastic people overall. I think this is, uh, uh, this is going to jumpstart the NFT activity uh, on, uh, on Avalanche. Uh, so uh, not that it was, you know, it, it was actually going along fine, but uh, uh, it's, it could be far stronger. And, uh, and we wanted to bring in some high quality NFT artists and uh and to replace you know just uh, just have uh far far better art uh available on chain so um and the more i think about nfts the more i, I move about in new york city the more i you know step into a gallery etc whenever i'm walking down the street and have some time um you know, the more i'm convinced that every artwork will have its own nft associated with it it's really uh, it's just something you have to do until recently, it was uh, confusing for many people because uh, you know they the, sort of the path kind of directed them towards proof of work chains, and artists don't want to use generally don't want to use proof of work chains, and uh, if you want to use an efficient uh, platform, a cheap platform with a great community, uh, so that's uh, that's you, you know where to go. So um, uh, the second one is uh, the Mona Lisa initiative which is the initiative by which the foundation will be purchasing some Avalanche NFTs. This already started and, uh, and the, uh, essentially this is a buying program for the foundation. It supports the NFT ecosystem and, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's part of what you need to do uh, in order to create a great collection at the foundation at the same time as uh, creating a great community around the foundation of people who built uh, NFTs uh, for Avalanche who help the NFT community for Avalanche. So, uh, so that's that. Um, let's. Uh, I'll take more questions on it. I'm sure there'll be many questions about these things. Try. We'll try to answer these as best as I can. I personally try not to endorse any NFT projects or many of them. I'm going to undoubtedly get a lot of requests to endorse stuff. Uh, every time I say something, even as soft as I like the art, I get criticized for it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. And then people get FOMO and whatever else. It just gets really confusing and complicated. So I'm going to try not to do that, even though I'm a normal human being and I have my art preferences and I, I have, you know, it's, I have every right to share something, you know, like uh, when I when I like some art. And so I plan to do that. Uh, I, I don't plan to muzzle that, but uh, but please don't pressure me into endorsing your project. It gets to be too much at times. So um, let's see. Third, and uh, one of the biggest announcements from um, last week is the project known as Evergreen. You've heard me refer to this. We kept calling it the institutional subnet. Um, but then again, that, that term in itself doesn't make sense. The, the institutional subnet, why should it be singular? There's going to be so many institutional subnets that, uh, that people will be confused about uh, which one they, that uh, they, they want to connect to. Uh, but the first one is evergreen. Remember what happened with subnets in general. We introduced the concept and uh, people didn't understand. And for the longest time, nobody was creating them, even though they were just sitting there ready to be used. And then we started uh, uh, showing the world how to use them. And then they started exploding. So uh, the same, I think, is true for institutional subnets. People don't really have a, uh, a framework for these things. They, they start wanting to do blockchain things. They get pulled into this, uh, you know, miasma of, uh, of uh, strange terminology introduced by people who don't know any of the past work. And then, you know, then they just get confused and they, they get left out somewhere or another, uh, and, you know, and, and it just is, is kind, of, kind of messed up. Um, and, and so to show the world how institutional subnets, institutional uh, blockchains can work, we decided to put together an exemplar, a template, uh, something that other people can look up to and say, this is how one would build an institutional subnet. So that's evergreen. It's the first of its kind. There'll be many more and there'll be many more whether or not we're behind it, but we provide the best technology and we understand this vision better than anyone. It's not a layer two vision. This is not one of those other things that you might have heard about. And it's not somebody taking uh, subnets and rebranding them into supernets or whatnot. This is the original vision. We are the people who built it. We're the people who came up with it. We're the people who provide tooling for it. And I want to show the world exactly how to do what people have been trying to do with permission networks and have been unable. 
permissioned closed networks have been um, an unmitigated disaster. R3 has done so many installations with Corda. And there have been so many attempts to do this with Quorum as well, and they've gone nowhere with, with the Hyperledger Fabric, an abandoned project by now. We knew they were going to get abandoned. We knew the aesthetic was wrong. We knew the foundation was wrong. They were dead ends. Not a single one of you wants to work on a dead end. Not a single one of you wants to use a technological dead end. It's kind of like trying to give you a Minitel in the age of internet. And they were destined to go nowhere. Subnets are different. They're open-ended. You can start with in a, in a private, private permission fashion, and you can open up as you see fit. You can go private permission, everything's closed. You only have one user that you've designated. So you have as many users as you like. You have varying levels of access for those users. You can introduce your own token for gas. You can use your own token for staking. The, the, the world is yours. You can open up validation and you can have entirely open validation. You can have an open network that then competes, let's say, with the C chain, uh, but at the same time complements the C chain. You can take your assets from your chain to the, to the C chain. You can use warp messaging to interact with services on other chains. So uh, that's a different vision. You haven't heard it, and it doesn't come with a whole bunch of people who know nothing but are very loud on Twitter. It's essentially just quiet building, and, uh, but the technologists, they understand. And uh, we're building this thing. We've been building it for some time. We've been talking to a fair number of institutional, uh, institutional players, and uh, I can't wait to show you the, uh, the, uh, the first uh, sort of the, the fruits of that effort. Uh, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So it's a suite. It's not a singular thing. It's a collection of, uh, of things. Um, and, uh, and it's a collection of institutional blockchain deployments, customizations, tooling, uh, and lots of branding even, lots and lots of things uh, that uh, institutions require in order to be able to provide um, uh, financial services using a blockchain. We make that easy. So if you have use cases, or if you know people who work at an institution, they understand blockchains, they want, they want their advantages, they have concerns, questions, whatever, uh, come talk to us because we provide the world's most flexible foundation for blockchain deployments, bar none. Absolutely the most flexible. The AVAX token is not jammed in there. The AVAX chains are not jammed in there. You can build a, a blockchain for yourself in exactly the same way you would have built a local area network back in 1985. And if you did that, you were way ahead of the curve because the internet then came in and connected, allowed you to connect those together into larger networks, into, uh, into uh, enterprise networks. And then you could connect enterprise networks together into the giant internet and then the explosion of the internet happened. So that's exactly the vision here. So you can create your own chain with your own rules, with your own virtual machine even, and with your own branded uh, wallet, with your own branded explorers, et cetera. All of those tooling are available to you on Avalanche. And, uh, and I'll, I'll gladly help direct people. I'll gladly connect you with the right people if you, if you want the expertise uh, that comes with, uh, you know, that you need some expertise to launch such a thing. Uh, but um, at, the, at the end of it all is uh, this vision for, um, for uh, flexible financial services powered by subnets. And, um, and that subnet uh, architecture, the, the looseness of it, the, the lack of requirements to use other, other stuff in the Avalanche ecosystem is what makes this incredibly powerful. There is no hub that you have to go through. We never fell into that entire trap of shared security or what have you that forced uh, some of our, our, uh, our competing systems uh, to build some bad architectural decisions deep down into the lowest layers of their systems. You do not need to go through, uh, you know, AVAX is useful as it is. We didn't have to jam pack its use into other people's business. So you can build your own network and then connect it with the rest of the Avalanche ecosystem. So um, let's see, one more thing. There's two more things that I need to discuss. One more thing is, is this off the grid business. A few weeks ago, and one of the main reasons why my sleep schedule is so messed up as I traveled a little too much. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure to be invited to Frankfurt for, uh, for Godzilla Games' new game called Off the Grid. And I saw the game. It is absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. I say this 
as uh, someone who's seen a bunch of cutting edge games recently, and uh, I've seen a bunch of these cutting edge games actually recently. Uh, I've seen a whole bunch of AAA games. I'm not much of a player myself, but I have seen a whole bunch of AAA games recently. And um, this one in particular looks out of this world. The, uh, the game design, the vibe, the, that je ne sais quoi, that's, I think, the hard thing to, to capture and convey to you all. It's just amazing. So uh, uh, the, uh, the director is uh, world-renowned. He's the director uh, behind uh, District 9. The uh, scriptwriter is amazing also, and, uh, and, and the weapons design, um, and, and I had a chance to meet all of these people. They are just fascinating. The weapons design person is the main weapons designer from Call of Duty, um, and uh, I had the, the opportunity to hold some of the weaponry in my hand. They have 3D printed some of this stuff. It's just out of this world to hold a 3D, 3D item, and, uh, and then I, I played with it. And the coolest part was uh, they convinced me um, just just by being super nice. They convinced me into donning a suit and uh, wearing a weird helmet that captures, you know, your facial expressions and so on. And so they captured all of my digital data and uh, and I there's a chance that uh, I might end up being an NPC in this game. So uh, I know that that's, uh, uh, that's typically used as a pejorative. He's such an NPC kind of a thing. But in that game, I, I worked hard to be an NPC. So uh, if you get the game... Uh, and if you find me in the game, I think you get to unload your clips into me or whatever. Um, I'll be there. I'll be saying stuff. And um, I practiced my lines. Um, I said them as best as I could. You know, I think I make an okay NPC. And, uh, and I, 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 I'm doing my part in that game you know, for ever saying things like, well, I'll, I'll tell you later. I won't, I won't, I won't spill the beans right now. But, uh, but my lines are super cool. You know what they're like? They're kind of like that scene at the end of Blade Runner where um, the replicant uh, looks up and says, you know, I have seen things that you people will not believe. So it's, it's of that genre, and, uh, and it was written perfectly well. And I don't know if I did a great job, uh, you know, enacting the, the, the part, but, uh, but, the, but the, um, the, the lines are fantastic. So I enjoyed it immensely. The game looks amazing. The architecture, like if you're an architecture student, you just have to go in and study this, uh, this, these games. Like, this is uh, these people have spent more time designing futuristic stuff than anybody else I know in Manhattan. I look around at the Manhattan buildings; they're not half as cool as the buildings in the game. And uh, and, uh, and if you're an out of work architect, uh, you should look into game design because it's pretty much the same tools, same set of skills, and you get to be far more creative. So uh, so anyhow, it's just an amazing game, absolutely stunning. I can't wait for it to come out. And uh, let's see. And then there is Lemonade. Um, so uh, we've talked about this. I often get asked a very simple question to which everybody should have an answer. Um, and, and that question is, what's the area that you think blockchain will disrupt the most? So it's a hard question because blockchains have already disrupted a whole bunch of areas. And anyone can say, well, look, payments, right, or remittances or what have you, like the easy stuff. And there are people who've made a career out of saying the same thing. You know, it's like banking the unbanked, which, you know, it's, it's possible that blockchains will help with that. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know that that's, you know, whatever it is. That there's, a, there's a lot going on and there's a lot to unpack behind those words. But one area I have always said is ripe for disruption is insurance. So uh, um, the... Uh, the, uh, the, the whole point of the insurance industry is to try to serve the needs of, of people by providing them with capital after catastrophic events or after unforeseeable events or after rare events. Let's just, uh, you know, to be even more general. And um, there is a lot of uh, benefits, financial benefits to be had from pooling risk. That's what insurance does. And uh, uh, so one of the nice things that, uh, that uh, blockchains can provide in this space is they make that, that process far more efficient. And saving a few tens of bips here, tens of bips there, actually makes a huge difference. We all overpay for insurance, all overpay for insurance. Warren Buffett, the greatest boomer of them all. I think maybe he's of the greatest generation. I'm not sure. But it seems, well, he appeals to boomers, the, 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 the wise man for boomers. So they all look up to him. He made most of his... Um, his uh, his uh, his fortune 
betting on insurance plays, right? Geico, it will save you so much, whatever. And, um, and those charges are insanely high. The amount of money we pay to insurance companies is far in excess of uh, their payouts. There's fat profits to be made there. And uh, worldwide, the reinsurance market also is in need, dire need of disruption. So leaving those aside, um, this one is, uh, is for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for small scale insurance claims. And uh, it's a great team behind it. It's uh, really, really fun. I think Roy is going to talk about uh, what it is uh, that he is building and why he chose Avalanche to build it on. So uh, take a look, and, uh, and, and, and if you're interested in the insurance space at all, or if you're interested in how blockchains might come into a very solid, very established space and completely turn it upside down, it's worth looking into. Uh, you know, Swiss uh, uh, Credit Suisse just went through a, a giant, uh, giant reorg, if you will, um, and, uh, and I think uh, it's time for Swiss Ray to get jostled up a bit because, uh, because I, don't, I don't know that the value they're providing um, is, is so moated. The moat that they have is actually pretty non-existent. And all it takes is one entrepreneur to say, the emperor has no clothes. I can do this much better with uh, better technology. And, uh, and then we're off to the races. So let's take some questions. That's everything from me on that end. Let's see where we are. Um, let's see, first question. Could you tell us more in depth about the SK subnet? No, not really because I'm, I'm not quite prepared for it. Um, there's going to be a lot going on there. I would love to be able to get into more details, uh, but uh, to be honest, I kind of, um, just yeah so so there's there's two things one i don't know what's been made public what's not been made public so i need to be careful and never say anything that hasn't been made public yet um because that, that will upset our partners in sk um but in general um, sk planet has a huge user base and uh, the user base is uh, consists of um you know, it's 38 million people um all sorts of people in korea as most of korea based and, uh, and they do a heck of a lot with SK Planet resources. I think the, uh, the thing that was mentioned that is public is uh, the, um, the, uh, the sort of the, the fan tokens, the um, loyalty points and similar ideas that, uh, that they have. It's the easy stuff. I'm not going to get into anything more complex than that. Uh, but so let's just take that as a driving example. I think that's a simple one. And um, that's... Uh, you know, imagine that uh, every interaction you have with a with a uh, with uh, with a K-pop star you know, happened and was mediated over uh, over um, over uh, over blockchains. Every single uh, interaction that you have with anything requiring loyalty points was done over over a blockchain, etc. How can Asia's adoption of Web three help drive blockchain technology forward? That's a great question. So clearly. Um, Asia is a huge force in the adoption of blockchains. They're generally way ahead of us when it comes to these payment systems. So um, uh, the, as you know, in China, they, the, most of the payments are digital. And um, you, know, you can go to China and, and spend a week or two uh, never touching actual currency. I know this because I did this. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's pretty amazing that, they can, uh, that they've advanced to that degree. Um, so... Uh, there are some really big markets in Asia, Korea being one of them, Korea also being an, an indicator country uh, that's ahead of everyone else in terms of uh, regulation. Japan's also also ahead, um, uh, but Japan also Japan also had a setback, I think, about uh, about a year and a half ago. They paused all licenses, et cetera, et cetera. They, they slowed down a bit in order to digest, I guess. Uh, they, they're moving forward again. So um, those two countries are, are in the prime you know, pole position uh, sort of leading the way for for adoption. So if you have millions and millions of people using blockchains on a daily basis, getting their financial services on there, being regulated, and uh, and and ensuring that uh, that uh, that a society can thrive with tokens on chain, create new platforms, new businesses, new opportunities, while also being able to answer to their regulators' needs, then that's going to be amazing for the rest of the world. Because I think what we need right now is some uh, some uh, examples of good usage for blockchains. I think some of our legislators have lost the plot. 
they are stuck in. They're coming, they're, they're, they're not technologists. They're typically lawyers. They're coming from, I don't know, five years ago. And if I look around to like five years ago or three years ago, it's easy to get into, into traps. It's easy to think, you know, all sorts of uh, incorrect thoughts that you sometimes hear enunciated. And uh, Asia showing the way would make a huge difference for the rest of the world. And it has been. So um, there is also the, uh, the, the, the party meeting in China that's coming up. If uh, Premier Xi mentions uh, blockchains there, then suddenly the world will change again. There's going to be uh, you know, suddenly a whole lot of people uh, in, in the West um, just, just scrambling to, to match. And, uh, and, and you know, they will scramble to ensure that there isn't a gap in technology. If Xi mentions CBDCs, uh, you know, rest assured that uh, that uh, there is going to be all sorts of uh, all sorts of craziness. Um, so we'll see what happens there. So, um, but Asia is very much a uh, in pole position right now, and uh, an adoption there will uh, will show, show serve as an exemplar. And also, there is this other thing, right? Both with developers, we leave aside regulators, with with regulators. I mean, uh, with uh, with developers and with business people. You gotta have some examples that they can point to before they adopt something, right? So nobody wants to be the the, the trailblazer. It's risky. Uh, they uh, they may or may not feel like they understand the space deeply enough. So it's it's tough to find uh, that one one example and say we're going to be doing this. And um, uh, so uh, so typically people in corporate uh, positions they want to make sure that they make decisions that are sound that are defensible. So they want to be able to say something like. We're going to follow along in this model. So and so already did this; it's successful. So that, those first examples are necessary for the devs. They need a template. They're like, "Oh, okay, I understand the components I need to build." Rearchitect or architecting a solution from scratch is hard, but approximately copying somebody else's template is a hell of a lot easier. So all the devs who are following along know this. So, uh, so I think uh, having some examples like this will really help adoption. How do I feel about currents, uh, about Avalanche's current state? And what's the most important thing you want to improve about the project? Good question. How do I feel? I feel great about where Avalanche is. We, we, uh, we said what we were interested in. We said what the mission statement was. We came up with a technology at the same time that matches exactly those needs. We, uh, uh, we never dangled a bunch of carrots in front of you. I never came up here and tried to dazzle you with my knowledge of Greek letters or, or random phrases I made up. So um, instead, we were from day one, up front and forward about what it is that we did. And we outlined a vision that is simple to understand. And to many, that's a vision that, uh, that, that, they, uh, that was foreign to them. So they tried to map it onto the simpler terms that, uh, that they're keeping in their minds. So, uh, so then, of course, you have to fight these fights. You have to just, you know, spend a lot of time, you know, changing the tooling, et cetera, changing the, the metrics that people are collecting, et cetera, et cetera, so that the comparisons are fair. Uh, but where we are now is, I think, very, very clear. And I think the, uh, the subnet vision is, uh, has been validated. We now have, I forgot, I think this morning someone was telling me that we have about 50 subnets, far more than I thought, 50 plus. So um, there's hundreds of them in testnet. And I know I, I've lost track of the number of teams I've spoken to who want to deploy their own. So there is a whole pipeline of these things. People are, are turning these things loose on a daily basis. Um, the, uh, uh, the games are doing incredibly well. They're isolated. They're not bogging down the rest of the chain or the rest of the system. One of our chains, one of our subnets is clearing more transactions per second than Ethereum is. So these are signs of success. Compare that to any other chain. They don't have it. Where's the layer two vision? Yeah, you have some centralized layer twos that are going to get, uh, you know, they're going to have their own issues. Sometimes they stop. Uh, they, they're regulatorily very exposed because they're running exchanges on a single machine, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of funky things going on with that vision, whereas the subnet vision, as exactly prescribed, is operating uh, the way uh, the way we said it would, and uh, it's providing all of those benefits that uh, that we talked about, uh, including fee isolation, load isolation, uh, including the flexibility of of having your own virtual machine, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I feel great about where we are. We also brought in uh, at Ava Labs, not, not necessarily Avalanche, but at Ava Labs, we brought in new technology that nobody else had. Our bridges are, uh, are pretty amazing. Uh, we also started this thing called Enclave. There is Enclave, um, uh, Enclave OTC, which is uh, known as Enclave Cross, the world's uh, cheapest way to, uh, to trade. So uh, that's uh, with no slippage. Um, so, um, and, and you can trade large amounts on it too. So, um, so there's a lot of technology that we brought into the space that, uh, uh, you know, even the, the stuff that's independent, even the Enclave stuff, it's, uh, it's on Enclave naturally. It got started on Enclave. It actually, uh, it recognizes all of the uh, Avalanche. Sorry, it got started on Avalanche and it's, it helps the Avalanche ecosystem. So, we're in a great position. Um, what are the sort of the challenges ahead for me? I will just mention them very, very briefly. It's very simple. In the very short term, we have the uh, summit coming up. You should come to the summit. You can go elsewhere. I don't know what else we're competing with, uh, but, uh, but the summit is going to be amazing. Last summit was fantastic. Just the right vibe of, uh, of people who are building things. Um, we're going to have a bunch of uh, academics come in, give their talks on uh, on the cutting edge. We're going to have a bunch of business people come and describe what it is that they're building. We're going to have a hell of a lot of artists there. It's going to be a great vibe. Last year was just the best conference I've ever attended. And I say this with my objective hat on. So um, come, that's, uh, I, I, will, I will do my best to, uh, uh, to have fun there. And, um, and we're, we're generally working really hard to make that a, a great experience for everyone. So there is that coming up. Uh, it's a great conference. The uh, second big thing about Avalanche that we need to work on is growing our community and getting the word out. So what I, I don't like is when we come up with something and then uh, and then people fight us and they fight us and they fight us. And then, and then the next day they realize, oh no, he was right all along. And then they steal our work, give it a new name and then uh, try to pretend that uh, that they came up with it, you know. So I already mentioned Supernets and the asinine play that goes with it. That's really uh, annoying. Um, but there are many other cases of this, you know. So we were, we've been giving talks on non-transferable tokens, etc. Those are also, uh, you know, something that that we we took seriously and uh, and uh, and used. Um, you you might have heard of them as soulbound tokens. That's a name that people came up with. Uh, multiple years after the fact, after we told them how, how these non-transferable tokens might work. So um, in any case, so uh, we need to get the word out. We need our community. I have always tried to steer everyone to not being a maxi. And now um, we're living in a, in a universe where, you know, we're we don't have a maxi community in Avalanche and we're taking flack from maxis. The Ethereum maxis of, uh, you know, they, they went crazy after the Evergreen announcement. Um, so uh, I won't get into all the details, but uh, we have a lot of haters now, and it's great to see the hatred. So uh, you know you're doing something right if the incumbent is hating on you, and uh, and they're just seething with hatred. It's not just normal hatred. Uh, it certainly is not rational, and kind of marks for me the end of the, the, the glory days of Ethereum. Once you start having this kind of uh, non-rational behavior, smart people don't go there. So, uh, but I need your help in attracting nicer, ha happier people into our community. So uh, get the word out, um, describe to everybody that we're technologically the, the most advanced chain out there. And we are by every objective metric, the set of people who, uh, like when I say we, I, me and my group at uh, Ava Labs, we are the set of, set of people who's, who's done the most in terms of bringing the best of science into blockchains. I would really like that. Um, otherwise we're in a great spot. Our DeFi is flourishing, our NFT, was okay. I think it wasn't it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. And now it's picking up even more with Alvasans, and uh, and so so I'm happy about that. Um, there are many other use cases that we're going to see explored. I think the next year and a half is going to be one of building exciting business use cases. And I kept saying this. I'll say this again. Those chains that thrive will be the ones that can absorb the growth. That, that can handle the, the varying requirements of different kinds of digital assets. And what better platform is there for that other than Avalanche? So since I think the answer to that question is, is clear, there isn't one, um, I think we're in a good spot. So um, 
And if uh, if any of you are having dark thoughts because hey, it's uh, you know it's a bear market, we don't know when it's going to end, blah blah blah. I'll just sort of reiterate that you know a whole lot of things have happened to the space, and uh, starting with the collapse of, of funds, um, with the collapse of of the whole the, the shtick that this idiot was running, um, the the entire FTX shtick that everybody went crazy over. Remember how he was he was deemed a boy genius for a while. So everything imaginable has, has happened, and, um, and 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 there have even been some some regulatory attempts to tr try to sort of overcorrect after after they fail to to fix the FTX problem. Even despite that, the space is holding up, and uh, and so uh, so when when the uh, the tide turns, and it has to turn because humans are humans, and and these things are cyclical. When the tide turns, uh, we're going to be one of the top uh, top chains. I hope uh, that uh, uh, that has the wherewithal to uh, to thrive and expand because we have the right architecture. Where did the name Avalanche come from? That's a good question. Uh, Avalanche came from the way the consensus protocol works. So uh, those of you who know how this protocol works, it starts out with the uh, the initial proposal of a let's in the initial paper it was a it was a transaction but really it's a it's a vertex or a block so imagine that somebody is proposing a block and uh and there may or may not be there's generally just a seed of a proposer at, at, at the at inception so there's only just think of it like a single crystal and around that crystal forms what what is kind of like a snowflake a set of uh, a set of nodes that are like okay this looks like a good block the transaction is within our valid and then that grows and it grows and it gets bigger. And uh, the, one of the protocols for growing that, that uh, snowflake is known as snowball. So it creates a highly packed snowball. And as that snowball becomes widely known in the network, it grows and grows and grows so as to become an avalanche. Um, we did consider some other names. And uh, uh, the other family of names would have been fire names. So Inferno, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, the fire names have a more negative connotation uh, than the snow names, and uh, snow lend, lends itself to, to better memes. And, uh, and those of you who know about the meme theory of, uh, of money, um, you, know, you might have heard of the labor, labor theory of value for money. Uh, you might have heard about the other theories of value for money. Um, these were debates that were had about 100 years ago. I think they were all proven wrong. Because today we understand that the uh, value of money comes entirely from the memeing power around it, and uh, and so so avalanche and snow lends itself better to uh, to, uh, to to memes. Um, I'm kidding, of course, about about what I said, um, but I think it's true to some to 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 a great extent that the value of money comes from social consensus around its value, and uh, social consensus is best reflected in 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 uh, in people who are creative who make memes around it um can you tell us how, how you and john Wu met or got connected sure um john Wu is the president of ava labs i met john in uh, i don't know when 2017 maybe um that would be six years ago maybe more maybe seven years ago uh, possibly maybe possibly 2015 actually um yeah, I think uh, I think it's around that time. So maybe about uh, about eight years ago or so. Um, I met him at Cornell. He was a trustee in the business school, and uh, he was one of our uh, uh, better known uh, alumni. And uh, uh, he came by and said, "Hey, I, I heard you're interested in blockchains." And uh, he was uh, on. He was one of the people on Wall Street very interested in digital assets at the time. Went on to do digital assets at Shares Post. Um, and uh, his, uh, uh, if you know him, his demeanor, his professionalism, his uh, clarity of mind just appealed to me immensely at, at, within the first three minutes of meeting him. And I, I thought, okay, well, I definitely, in whatever I do, I want to work with him. So, uh, so then when the opportunity came up to work together on Ava Labs, I was delighted. I'm super proud to be working with him. He's one of the pros, 
He knows Wall Street very well. He knows all of the asset issuers. He knows all of the asset managers. Uh, he just knows everybody in the space. And uh, most importantly, he also understands the crypto side of things. And it's been an honor and pleasure to work with him. Um, so uh, I don't see who the person is who's asking the question when I see it here. But uh, uh, but I don't know how you know John Wu. But uh, but now I hope everybody has gotten a glimpse of him. Um, he's it's if you have seen him on Spaces, um, he has, or if you've seen him on CNBC, he appears on on TV fairly often. Uh, he has a clarity of vision that uh, is is very rare in the space. And uh, he articulates it incredibly well. And, um, and I think he will slowly but surely uh, convert every single person on Wall Street to be a great believer in blockchains in general and in the avalanche in particular, because obviously we have the better technology for uh, digitizing things. OK, on that note, I'm going to wrap up. Um, so thank you all very, very much for bearing with me. Um, and uh, uh, it's been a fantastic set of uh, travels. As I said, just came back from Korea. I'm still recovering from that trip, uh, but uh, but I'm super excited about where we are as a project, super excited about where we're going, and super excited having recently met yet another group of, uh, of builders who are building on us uh, across sectors in, uh, in a very significant uh, country. So, uh, so I'm thrilled about where we are. I hope you are too. And uh, I hope to see you at the summit. But if I don't see you there, see you on chain. Take care.